Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our online seminar entitled Too Big to Fail, a Transatlantic Perspective. My name is Pierre Schlosser. I'm the scientific coordinator of the Florence School of Banking and Finance, and it is my pleasure to be with you today. This online seminar is part of our series on banking resolution, which we started in January of this year. Today's episode, if you will follow us, our last online discussion in July on to, fa to fail or not to fail, that's a lot of failing, you might say. However, I'm certain that there will be many occasions to talk about successes today, not only about failures. After all, these are two sides of the same coin, as I guess that the whole point of the matter is to have successful failures, isn't it? Anyway, I have the honor and privilege to introduce and moderate today's seminar with Wilson Irvin from Credit Suisse, who is live from Madison Avenue in New York City. Welcome, Wilson. We appreciate the additional effort you made to be with us so early in the morning. Patrick Onohan will be our commentator. Patrick is affiliated to the Washington-based Peterson Institute for International Economics and to Trinity College Dublin and join us live from Dublin. Patrick Wilson, thank you for being with us. Both of you are famil very familiar with our school and our platform, and it is also really nice to see a few usual suspects among participants. Let me, however, spend two minutes to introduce the school to those of you who don't know it yet. The Florence School of Banking and Finance is a recent program of the European University Institute, EOY in short. As you can see, the EOY is located on the northern hills of Florence in Italy. It was established in 1972. That's exactly 45 years ago, so we're not really the new kids on the block. <clears throat> Ever since, the EOY has become a world classic academic institution in social sciences, offering leading PhD programs in economics, law, political science, and history, as well as executive education courses. Our School of Banking and Finance focuses on the latter aspects set up in January 2016. The school is a European platform that brings together public and private practitioners on the one end and academics on the other to exchange views on recent topics of financial surveillance. You can see on the slide <coughs> the four substantive areas of the school. Our long-term goal is to shape the emergence of a common regulatory and supervisory culture in Europe. Therefore, besides our annual conference, our online seminars, and our closed doors executive seminars, we offer around 10 executive training courses per year, both in residential and interactive online formats. Since its creation, the school has therefore trained more than 800 experts coming from 40 countries. Our training participants were mostly active in national central banks and in European institutions and agencies. However, we also gladly counted on the participation of staff from national supervisory authorities, the private sector, and from academia. We have um, three residential courses coming up next. The first at the beginning of October on bank regulation and systemic risk uh, held in Florence. The second at the very end of October on the regulation of shadow banks hosted in Amsterdam, and the third at the end of November on banking resolution in Florence, co-organized with the School of Transnational Governance. All those courses last between two and four days, and for more details, you can check our training webpage, which has been recently and very nicely redesigned by my colleague, Jan. Last but not least, let me seize this occasion to recommend to those of you who are interested in attending any of those courses that they should reduce their fast as seats are becoming very scarce. OK, now, this being said, I'd like to move over to you, the audience. You are more than 120 today, and I can very well imagine each of you in front of this of his or desk computer or iPad, whatever it is, with a cup of coffee or tea. Let me also say hello to a few of our recurring participants, Angelos, Laurence, Baudvin. It's really good to have you back. 42 nationalities are represented today, but where are you from? Europe, as we can see to a large extent, but we're also very happy to welcome participants from Pakistan, Brazil, China, Morocco, and South Africa. As far as institutions are concerned, we're very glad to count on several participants from the Brussels-based uh, Single Resolution Board, the Frankfurt-based European Central Bank slash SSM, and the London-based European Banking Authority as well as representatives from many other European and national institutions, academic and private entities that we have captured 
on our word cloud. What else? 41% of you are women, 59% are men, and overall you have around seven years of professional experience on average. A tight majority of you are trained economists, but there's also quite a large share of lawyers among you. Surely other profiles are also represented. Lastly, a majority of you have a master's degree, while 29% of you have a PhD and 10% a bachelor's degree. Uh, once again, I'm very grateful that so many of you are with us today, also because I count on each and every one of you today to make our digital conversation interactive, provocative, and thoughtful. So here's how this online seminar will be sequenced. Wilson will provide us with a 20, 25 minute presentation. It will be followed by a seven to eight minute reaction by Patrick. This will leave us with around 30 minutes of interactive Q&A where you'll be able to share your thoughts, comments, and questions in our chat box. The presentation will be punctuated by three polls where you will be asked to provide your anonymous views on a given question. And uh, this being said, I'm very glad to leave the floor now to Wilson and Patrick. In the interest of time, I will not guide you through their biographies. They are available on our website. So Wilson, I will now ask you to switch your camera on and Mike, um, while I will tune back in for the Q&A later on. So Wilson, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks, Pierre, to you and the Florence School of Banking for organizing this event this morning or this afternoon. Um, when I've looked over your colloquium, uh, many of the speakers are senior central bankers or academic economists. Uh, I'm a private sector banker, which is a, a simpler profession uh, by its nature. Uh, but I also um, had a ringside seat to the crisis. I was chief risk officer of Credit Suisse uh, for the decade of the 2000s, uh, including through the crisis years. Uh, that included a, a period of preparing for the crisis to make sure that we were well prepared for it and the quote unquote fun of steering through the crisis uh, when things began to hit in 2007. Uh, our bank survived without public money, but the ride was not much fun. Uh, the period in retrospect was intense, awful, uh, but from an intellectual standpoint, uh, it remains fascinating and I think it still has a number of lessons to teach us. Uh, since the crisis, I've actually spent most of my time on policy issues trying to understand how did the wheels come off the wagon of the so-called great, great moderation, the period of 25 years of relatively low volatility in financial markets and economies. Um, so I spent uh, a lot of the last eight years working on practical steps to make sure we never have to go through this again. Um, but luckily, um, uh, if, we, um, if I do make any mistakes that an academic or a central banker can spot, we are joined by Mr. Patrick Conahan, who is a very senior uh, central banker. He headed the Irish Central Bank during the Reconstruction period uh, and is also a highly trained economist. So I'd like to turn now to our mission for today. We've got five objectives. First, a quick taxonomy of the crisis to try and pull together the mainstreams now that we have a bit of historical perspective. Two, to think about fixing what are the key things that broke down. Third, how do we make those effective? Fourth, comparing the approaches that we've seen in the US and EU, which I think is interesting for those of you engaged in public policy, and a status check on where we are today. Um, on your screen, you'll see a poll. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think I'd be very curious about is your own views in terms of what was the central problem exposed by the recent crisis. And as you uh, put together some of your uh, commentary on that, I'll talk through some of the history and some of my thoughts around that. The FT has uh, been having recently a 10-year anniversary of the crisis, and that begs the question, when did the crisis actually start? Um, if you look at the chart on, on the page here, you can see the first bump up in the U.S. Volatility Index, or the VIX, uh, what some people call the Fear Index, in February 2007. And that was when HSBC announced a surprise $2 billion loss, big at the time, uh, based on exposure to U.S. subprime. Uh, at the time, this was shocking, but it became all too regular over the course of the next 18 months. But I think most people date the crisis uh, from that larger bump that you'll see around the mid-summer uh, of 2007 in August when BNP suspended liquidity on its large mortgage mutual funds. Um, now, for some people that say, why is that such a big deal? 
to me, the answer is it was a huge asset class. It had always been a, generally a high quality credit class, given the diversity of the US market, and highly liquid. And now we find out you can't even price these. Uh, and to me, the signal that this had really moved from a specific asset class crisis to a more general crisis is walking the trading floor back from some of the mortgage people that day uh, and hearing the trading floor people yelling, key bills are on fire. And through August, we had the biggest uh, head spread uh, move that we've seen in 20 years. The difference between U.S. T-bills and bank deposits uh, widened very suddenly, and that's a classic flight to quality trade, and it's certainly something you don't want to see as a CRO. That means that it's a much more systemic thing, uh, and the fear index has now grown to 30. That means that volatility is about three times higher than it was at the start of the crisis, or about three times higher than it started today. And by this time, many of the main credit markets were seized up. Uh, big junk underwritings were hung. Um, you saw mortgage brokers failing. Uh, it was a difficult time and seemed quite chronic. But it turns out you hadn't seen anything yet. Uh, in September of 2008, uh, you can see the spike here in volatility uh, and a dramatic transformation, really any fear index that we look at in the private sector, where the crisis really changed temperature. It went from a chronic disease that you could maybe treat at home to a cardiac arrest. Uh, and we saw markets hit fear levels that we hadn't seen since the 1930s. Um, and to me, the real trigger to that was the Lehman event. Uh, that uh, exposed the US government's unwillingness or inability to resolve a large bank safely. Um, we saw it within the course of a single week, uh, the nationalization of the largest insurance company in America, the disappearance of every single investment bank in America, and a government guarantee of all the money market funds across the country. So a dramatic change and something that stayed in a intensive care unit for about six months. Now, by the time we got to spring of 2009, the U.S. was starting to leave the heavy crisis period. Uh, but as you'll notice, I've said there are three phases to the great financial crisis, and we haven't crossed the Atlantic yet. The third phase I'd like to speak to is really in Europe. And this happened in a different time scale. Uh, you clearly had some early and severe troubles in some of the more Anglo-Saxon countries, uh, like Northern Rock in the UK, uh, or the Irish or Icelandic examples. But the continent was broadly smoother, with a few exceptions. Uh, there was early and strong government support. Uh, and that helped avoid the worst of phase two. If you look, for example, at a core country like the Netherlands, uh, markets were generally behaving OK. You saw some spread widening. Um, but markets didn't go crazy. Uh, the real economy slowed a bit with the global recession. Uh, but unemployment there only rose uh, from about 4 to 5 percent over the three years from 2008 to 2011. So a pretty different experience compared to the United States. But in 2011, we saw a periphery crisis in Europe that I see is really linked to the overall global financial crisis. If you look at countries like Greece or Portugal, Spain, or particularly Italy, you saw a major spike in yields. Uh, in particular, you started to see both bank and sovereign spreads rise together. And in fact, their yields converged. Banks were seen to rely on local governments for support, and vice versa. And this gave rise to a phrase that some people called the doom loop. So instead of governments protecting their banks or banks funding their government, this was seen to move from a virtuous circle to a vicious circle. And this required some very dramatic actions from the ECB, the famous whatever it takes line from Mr. Draghi, uh, as well as policy issues around the BRD and the SSM to try and disentangle the dual move. So enough history. What are we going to do about this? Um, during the post-crisis period, starting in 2009 and really getting going in 2010, uh, we saw a million reform ideas surface. Maybe not a million, but on this page, I've tried to keep track of a personal list of at least one idea that somebody thought would be the key to fix the crisis. And there are many views here, whether it's resizing banks, narrow banking, compensation rules, capital rules, derivatives, et cetera. 
there are many reforms. Uh, some of these are good. Uh, some of these, in my view, are snake oil. But I do think actually one is central, and it's the one on the lower right. And that's because too big to fail in bank resolution, to me, was the key step that you saw when you moved from the phase one crisis to the much more dramatic rise in volatility in the U.S. in phase two. And it was also at the core of the doom loop in Europe. So to me, that was the trigger that took you from a credit crunch into a much more dangerous systemic phase. And if you don't believe me, uh, there are some uh, people with much fancier resumes who also think of this as really the core issue that you need to crack and make sure that we don't have to relive something like we did in 2008. Now, unfortunately, that leaves a tricky question. Exactly how are you going to do that? What would really solve too big to fail, and can it be solved? So what I'd like to do now is also ask you, while we're going through some of this, what's your view on where we stand today? Have we cracked the problem of too big to fail for the large Western banks, say the ones that are a trillion in size or larger? Or are we still in the middle of a work process? So if I'm looking right here, it looks like a large majority currently would say that we need government support to handle large failure. And so I want to talk a lot about the technicalities of what's been built, <clears throat> what's in progress, and where, in my view, I think we've, uh, we've gotten to. Now, the first problem is to try and figure out what is going to be your policy. And if you take yourselves back to 2010, frankly, there were a lot of proposals out there. Uh, there were a couple of people who really said uh, in the sort of top two categories, um, I'd call these sort of the hard-nosed um, reformers. Uh, they said, you don't really need to do much. You just need to make sure banks know they can fail, uh, run through the system a few times, and people will get uh, but I think after Lehman, that was exposed as a very dangerous policy. You had people saying that forced M&A, forced mergers, uh, was the, the key solution, or perhaps mutual aid, that banks would form consortiums to aid each other, uh, like we tried to do with Lehman Brothers. But that tends to push the problems from the weak to the strong. And it's not clear to me that that actually cracks the problem, particularly when you've got very large banks in trouble. Uh, if you've got two sick trillion-dollar institutions, does combining them make the system stronger? Or have you simply added a huge organizational complexity at a time when you've really got to fight other fires as well? Some people would say it's obvious if the problem is too big to fail, you should simply break up the banks. Uh, and that remains a, a very common theme today. But if you look through history, there have been a number of crises that are really driven by small banks that have been equally systemic. Uh, for example, the 1930s in the United States, uh, where we lost about a third of the banking system here uh, as bank runs propagated through the Midwest. So it's not clear to me that size is the key issue. Uh, Mervyn King and others have talked about some more radical proposals, like completely redesigning what banks look like into narrow banks. Um, but there's nothing really on this list that strikes me as a clear winner. We need to figure out a new strategy, something that would have better properties. And where the world has evolved to over the last several years is something called bail-in. Uh, it's a new tool, but in some ways, it's, it's not that new. Um, it's really adapting a well-known tool that's used in many countries, especially the US uh, under Chapter 11, where you reorganize a, a firm's debts, but you keep the core operations going. There are a number of advantages to this procedure. It's a single party transaction. You don't have to force a merger. You don't need a consortium. Um, you uh, can do it, um, I think, for a single bank problem as well as a systemic problem. Um, you do need to accelerate timing. 
I think we found that um, in the case of the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers or even in the prepacks that uh, organizations like CIT were going through, that a classic judicial process without a lot of work would be too slow. But if you could compress that timing, you could reorganize the liabilities and get yourself to a safer place pretty quickly. So a simple example here, let's say you've got an old balance sheet with about 600 billion of assets. And let's say that a little over 400 billion of them are franchise liabilities. Think of that as retail deposits, um, swaps, payables, transaction obligations, things that people see as, as money and where they're very nervous about credit risk, they tend to be short-term and runnable. And below that, we have things that are more recognizable in corporate finance as a capital stack. Starting at the bottom, 25 billion of equity, 25 billion of, say, subordinated debt, and 120 billion of senior debt. So you funded your assets. Now, let's say you had a $25 billion loss, and your assets got written down to 575 billion. Starting from the bottom, that would mean you'd have to write off your equity, and you'd convert, say, your subordinated debt into new equity. That gives you 25 billion of fresh equity against hard assets. And let's say that you also uh, bailed in 15% um, uh, of your senior debt to make sure you could get to 45, 50 billion of fresh equity. So you're actually better capitalized than before on harder assets. This would give you a clean asset side and a much more well-funded liability side without the need for merger partner. And you might ask, why are these numbers so unusual? These are actually the numbers of Lehman Brothers. And I think if we had the Balin technology at the time of Lehman, we could have done a much better job at calming markets and getting to a good solution than the chaos we saw in September of 2008. I think the bail-in regime has a number of important implications. Uh, I think it can lower contagion because it reduces the pressure for runs. You're not putting losses, as we did in Lehman, on many of those operating liabilities that are short-term in nature. You don't impact the world of counterparties or market infrastructure. And it also doesn't force you to do fire sales. There was another contagion loop through the asset markets where some firms were trying to sell that would push down markets that would create a little bit of asset side contagion in other institutions, this would allow you to break some of that fire sale loop. Importantly, it creates new equity at the point of the problem. It doesn't push the problem to other banks through mutual aid or forced mergers, and it doesn't impair sovereign credit. So you're trying to address the problem where it occurs, not bring other resources from good counterparties and forcing them to take the losses. So now let's look at where we've gotten to in implementation. And there are really uh, different paths in the US and Europe. I'll go through this fairly quickly. But the US started with a number of advantages. It's a single large jurisdiction. It has a long history of FDIC resolution, which have done literally thousands of banks. Uh, and it happened to have a holding company structure with large amounts of long-term debt financing, which is, as you saw in the, in the Lehman case, a very helpful prerequisite here. In Europe, you've got much more complexity in terms of jurisdiction, much more complexity in terms of bank structure, uh, and you also have more, I'd say, historic expectation of state aid, much more of a mixed economy view of the right solutions. And that certainly led rise to some complexities. The US, from a legislative standpoint, passed Dodd-Frank quite early. It's an angry document. It didn't really think about bail-in, to be honest. It was passed in 2010 before um, that concept was fully in, in the public eye. Um, and we've had to sort of backfill bail-in technology into Dodd-Frank. Uh, but there is a narrow path to do that. And I think some of the lawyers and central bankers, uh, people like Randy Gwynn and Jim Wigand, did a great job in retrofitting bail-in into the orderly liquidation authority. Uh, Europe took a much more uh, cautious and thoughtful approach, built the BRD over many years through many consultations, uh, and that's now in force. If you cut this by a timeline, you can, I've shown four countries here, 
you can really think of this intellectually as sort of a three-phase process. In 2010, you start to see people pass laws, whether Dodd-Frank in the U.S., which was really liquidation-oriented, UK creating a bridge capability, or Switzerland building a cocoa model uh, for its banks, a contractual bail-in approach. Uh, this I would call sort of the experimental phase. In 2011 to 12, we saw the FSB get quite active uh, with something called the key attributes. Uh, the key attributes, I think, were essential, uh, a very good document, and essential in kind of organizing the world in a way that was consistent. Uh, and I have to commend uh, people like Paul Tucker, Hervé de Villaroche, Eva Hupkis, uh, and that group for building a document that, that I think still reads very well today. And now I'd say if you look at the bottom part of this screen, uh, we're really in implementation phase. We're building out things like how exactly do swaps um, get stayed, exactly what kind of uh, TLAC or loss absorbency do you want to build into the system, uh, and how do we bed those down in a durable way. So the, the next question to me is, okay, so this is an interesting timeline. I think the intellectual history is interesting. Uh, and we seem to be on our way to something that might work. Um, but where exactly are we now? Some people would say, well, we're not done until 2022 or 2025 when all of these things are set to bind. Would it work today if we ran into a surprise crisis? Let's look first at the United States. Uh, that has been helped by history, by the uh, fact of U.S. holding company structure. But I think there are, the big banks in the United States are resolvable today. Um, and people like Marty Grunberg, who runs the FDIC, uh, and others, got a quote here from Paul Tucker uh, from 2013 that I'd ask you to read, um, that I think credibility in the US market was achieved. They crossed the Rubicon in about 2013. At the time, he said he didn't think it would be completely smooth, and it'll be better in a year or two, and we have been able to make a number of improvements since 2013 to help uh, solidify Paul's assertion. Rating agencies, credit markets, and investors also agree with this. Uh, if you look, for example, at the, at the debt trading markets, the so-called too-big-to-fail uplift disappeared around 2012-2013. Uh, Paul also said uh, that Europe had not reached quite the same point, but contrary to some commentary, is not that far behind. Now, if you look at EU resolution, the BRD didn't really come into force until last year, but there actually have been a number of resolutions in the post-2010 environment, and we've seen a major shift to private capital. If you look at some of the names up here on the screen, whether in Denmark, UK, Cyprus, Austria, Portugal, a number of, a number of countries, uh, you can see a number of resolutions have actually been executed over this period, and this isn't the full list. Three takeaways in my view. Almost all of these were funded by private capital, not public resources, and that's a huge shift from where we were in 2008 and 9. Uh, there's one glaring exception that we'll come back to. Second, very few of these transactions went below subordinated debt. You had a couple of cases where senior debt was used, uh, such as Cyprus, but very few went below subordinated debt. And third, and perhaps uh, the most subtle thing here, uh, none of these transactions resemble the other ones. These are all ad hoc. They're all very different. Um, and I think that's a big issue for Europe. Um, investors like consistency. They like precedent. Um, and to date, we haven't really been able to achieve that in Europe. Hopefully, as the SRB powers uh, become more relevant to the system, we'll be able to impose more order on the system. But I think the, uh, the experience today of international investors has been uh, that the rules, while there are rules of the road, the implementation of those rules is incredibly varied and difficult to plan for.
Mr. Draghi actually commented on this uh, after the Cyprus event and said the following, a bail-in itself is not a problem. It's the lack of ex-ante rules known to all parties and the lack of capital buffers that can make it a disorderly event and gives the impression of an ad hoc approach. And I think he's very right. Uh, without time consistency, without buffers, uh, and without clear expectations, it's much more difficult to run uh, a system that works as efficiently as we want it to work. So where do we stand today under Mr. Draghi's two principles, the lack of ex the ex-ante rules and the capital buffers? The good news is that we have strong rules in place today. I think both BRD and Dodd-Frank work and are fully in force. Resolution plans have advanced dramatically, although that depends country and country by, and bank by bank. And we've got an ISDA protocol in place to stop swap unwinds. In terms of capital buffers, uh, let's look at that. Uh, that's easier for a banker to talk about. It's more of our natural stock and trade. Uh, in the United States, we have roughly a trillion dollars for the big eight banks of gone concern loss absorbency. Now, in the debates over whether you've crossed the Rubicon or not, people sometimes talk about, well, are the, are, are the resolution plans sufficiently advanced? Does this work? Does that work? But if you have a trillion dollars of resourcing in the right place on your side, you can get through a lot of bumps in the road. And to me, this is one of the powerful things that uh, we've achieved with the TLAC rules in the U.S., aided by a little bit of historical accident that the U.S. had a holding company which already had a fair amount of the right kind of resourcing. If you look at Europe, there are a number of countries, and perhaps there are some others I, I should have included in this list, but if you look at, for example, the UK, uh, the average of their GSIBs is at about 24% TLAC to risk-weighted assets today. Uh, Germany, with a statutory change, they only have one GSIB anymore, but that GSIB's at about 34% TLAC from their latest disclosures. Uh, and the two Swiss banks are at about 30% of TLAC to RWA today. So Europe is, um, in at least those countries that I've just looked at, um, not that shy of a half a trillion of gone concern loss absorbency. Um, and at those banks, I think can be said to have crossed the Rubicon. Uh, that's a large amount of TLAC resourcing, uh, and it would have been sufficient to get even the most poorly managed bank from the crisis. Uh, if you look at the GSIB losses, not some of the more extreme losses that small banks had, but the worst managed GSIB, that would be ample resource to take even the worst managed GSIB and recapitalize it with plenty of room to spare. So when I do my own back of the envelope calculations, I would say that because of the advances we've had in terms of rules and the advances we've had in terms of building out usable capital buffers today that are subordinated using some methodology, that about 70% of the Western GSIBs have crossed the too big to fail Rubicon. And the scale of resourcing we've put in place there is already far larger than what we actually use in 2008 in terms of solvency support. Now, there are some challenges. Uh, in the US, the challenges tend to be more towards uh, the old time religion. Uh, so there is a discussion about potentially repealing, repealing Title II. Uh, and there's significant debates on that going on now. I certainly hope that is not the case. Um, while Title I has advanced a great deal and has achieved credibility under Fed and FDIC uh, tests, um, if you look back at 2008, there were a lot of twists and turns in the road. And I think it would be policy malpractice not to have some administrative capability to deal with those surprises. Um, we also have... Um, uh, Federal Reserve liquidity constraints that constrain the Fed more than they were constrained in 2008. And that's a concern because of the importance of liquidity in these types of crises. In the EU, I've spoken a bit about the uncertainty and complexity. Uh, the rules mostly require bail-in, uh, but we don't have MREL in place in many countries. We're still talking about exactly how non-preferred senior will be built out in some places. There are significant local politics in some countries. Um, uh, we saw, for example, uh, what some have called BRRD loopholes uh, in the recent Italian resolutions, 
uh, where it really was public money and not private capital uh, that was used to solve the problem. Uh, Elke Koenig has spoken about the need to address this and get to a more consistent place for Europe, um, a more usable MREL format, uh, and I think she's dead right on that. I think Europe still, in some of these countries, has some important uh, work to do there. I'll mention a third challenge, which is more of a global challenge. Um, we've seen more ring fencing, more compartmentalization of banks. Uh, and as a banker and a former risk officer, I find that very dangerous. Uh, in my own bank, one of the things as risk officer that gave me some comfort was the diversity of our businesses. And even in the crisis, not all of those businesses went bad at the same time. But if you force each one of those businesses to live and die in its own capital, uh, you run into a much bigger challenge. I think those businesses, the, a bank that is more compartmentalized is more likely to fail. And when we've looked at some numbers for, say, a bank that had all of its capital trapped in four or five subsidiaries, I think the mathematics suggests that that would be something like three to ten times more likely to fail than a bank that had good capital flexibility. Now, part of the reason we've gotten here is that people are thinking much harder about what happens in resolution, what happens in failure, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, but I think if we try to go for a localist, protectionist approach, uh, we can actually back ourselves into a more dangerous corner. So I've asked uh, the organizers to put up a poll. You may have seen the same this question before. Um, uh, but I'd be interested in your views as we've gone through uh, some of the advances in too big to fail in resolution. Uh, how that has affected your views on this, and also be very interested in your questions and, and the session afterwards on what are the remaining issues that, uh, for those of you who are skeptics, think are important. So it looks like we've made a little progress here in terms of people thinking that uh, it's now a more practical solution, but still a lot of skepticism. And again, I'd be very curious to hear some of the specifics behind uh, the thinking of all of you on the call uh, in the Q&A session. So a quick summary, and then I'll turn this over to, to Patrick uh, for his commentary. Um, this slide is a picture of a central bank headed to work back in 2008. Uh, some of you may have actually felt like that person during that time period. If you think about the crisis in the three phases we talked about, the first phase are, are credit crunches or asset market shocks. I think eliminating all of those would be difficult. Um, credit is going to move up and down as sectors get more or less healthy. And I'm not even sure that trying to solve all of those is effective. Uh, there's the Minsky critique that the more you try and solve that, the more people take down their buffers uh, and you get inherent risk buildups. But I do think we can do a lot to eliminate the trans transmutation of that into systemic crises, whether into the US form or whether into the European form. And if we can solve that, I think we can avoid a lot of the destruction that we saw in 2008 or 2011. In my view, bail-in is a key and durable tool to fight these crises and to change and to contain crises much more into a phase one rather than a phase two or phase three mode. Uh, you have a lot of simplicity from the single point of control, and you're trying to attack the problem at the source, not spread the problem to others. And it removes things like the sovereign doom loop and the government burden, which has such toxic politics and potentially uncertain outcomes. So for, from my perspective, having been in the middle of a lot of this uh, from a private sector side, but working with a lot of public sector people, uh, I think we've actually made shockingly rapid progress from a problem we didn't really have a good handle on how to solve seven or eight years ago to a situation where, in my view, uh, the majority of the large Western banks uh, could be solved today if they ran into a major problem without the need for government capital. Uh, we've still got some work to do. There still are some challenges, well, but I think we've made enormous up. progress. The sun has come out. So with that, I'll turn it over to Patrick and, for his uh, view, uh, and then look forward to your questions. Yes. Oh, it's sort of shining on one side of my face. Now, I want to say that I agree 
with the approach that Wilson has taken. Maybe he's slightly more enthusiastic and, and optimistic than I am. Um, but um, instead of going through in any detail what he has covered, I'd just like to spend the seven minutes I have talking about six points which I think are relevant and um, you know can be brought into the, into the picture. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about deposit insurance, which was not mentioned by Wilson, and I think rightly not mentioned by him, but a lot of people do mention it in this context. I then want to say something about bailable bonds versus equity, and whether we've gone the right way in uh, emphasizing bailable bonds as uh, what can be used in, in, um, in a, a, a too big to fail or a nearly too big to fail situation. Then I want to talk about emergency liquidity assistance and the role that it has played in the past and might play in the future, and whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, and whether it could undermine all the grand plans that have been made in uh, the US and on this uh, side of the Atlantic as well. Finally, I want to talk about flip-flopping and move from flip-flopping to talk about politics and the role of politics in, um, in these uh, situations, which I think is central and which maybe could undermine some of the uh, nice schemes that have been developed. Deposit insurance. A lot of people say if only we had a completed banking union with fully mutualized deposit insurance, all of these problems would go away. Some problems would go away, but not these ones. Uh, a European deposit insurance uh, mutualized scheme will not solve this. What are the problems with the deposit insurance in Europe at the moment? Well, there are a number of problems. The first one is that the national funds are not large enough in, in many cases in the smaller countries. The smaller sovereigns are not credible as backstop. Um, for a large bank failing with a, a high percentage losses, uh, it's just not credible. Mutualization would solve this problem, the problem of credibility, uh, but it's not on the cards for obvious reasons. Creditor countries fear that legacy issues might still remain in some small debtor countries. But it, it wouldn't solve the major problem because it's not the one, less than 100,000 euro depositors that cause the liquidity runs. It's the wholesale depositors. And the existence of a 100,000 deposit cover does not protect you at all against that. And you will have big liquidity meltdowns if uh, the market feels the bank is going to fail. So I think Wilson's right to leave deposit insurance out of the picture. And I tend to under under um, emphasize or, or not, not to emphasize the um, uh, moving to uh, mutualized deposit insurance. Now, the doom loop is my second point. Um, and Wilson's emphasized this. And maybe in this case, he's overemphasized it. Because I think for, it was only for a few smaller countries in Europe that bank bailout costs really uh, presented a, a major threat to debt sustainability for government. Cyprus, Iceland, Ireland, clearly. But for the other, for the other countries, it was actually more the other leg of the doom loop, the, the, the leg that goes from uh, stressed sovereigns to weakening banks. So you had that in Greece. To some extent, you had uh, Portugal, Italy. Um, so I don't emphasize the doom loop as much as, as has been. Remember that the, the failure risk, the disorderly failure risk that presented itself in 2008 was contained in the United States, in the UK, in Switzerland, by what you could regard as financially manageable bailout costs. The governments did have enough resources. They could put their hands in their pockets and pay those bailout costs. In fact, in the US, the bailout costs turned out to be uh, negligible or, or even they got, got some, some money back. I mean, they took risks, but they got the money back. It was politically and socially unacceptable and a sizable economically uh, inefficient way of doing things. But it, the doom loop is not really the, the, the reason the unsustainability of, of, of uh, government debt has not been the reason except for a number of smaller countries. Third point, available bonds versus equity. Uh, have we gone in the right way? Emphasizing these special bailable bonds, or in some countries, it's just as in Germany, say, well, all bonds are going to be bailable. Do, does the idea of bailable bonds actually provide an additional dimension to investor scrutiny? Um, so you have different types of investors who might lose their money. Does that help the stability of the system and give you early warnings? 
That was suggested by Charlie Calamiris years ago. He was advocating the use of uh, required levels of, of subordinated debt. But the other argument comes from another Charlie, Charles Goodhart, who says that they introduce a dangerously destabilizing element with the market value of the bailable bonds dropping sharply, dropping over a cliff at the very first hint of any kind of bad news. Uh, I think that can happen, and I think we saw that happening to some extent uh, in early, um, when was it? Early this year or early last year? I'm losing track. Uh, the Deutsche Bank situation. But do we worry about that? Do we worry about sharp market prices in beta pool debt? That's what you're meant to see. If the market has lost confidence in the bank, the, that fall in price is a market signal. It's a canary in the coal mine, which helps people focus on the problem and solve it promptly. My uh, difficulty with bailable bonds is not that, but the fear that they will always be more difficult politically to bail in than equity. When equity prices fall even to zero, governments do not step in generally. They Investors in equity know they could lose all their money. Investors in bonds, even if they're called bailable bonds, may not uh, feel like that, and the politicians may, in fact, prevent the bail-in, as we have seen in a number of recent cases. Next point, I think, is my fourth point. The role of emergency liquidity, not mentioned by Wilson, but actually emergency liquidity often comes into play and could undermine what we're talking about here. The first draw, when a, central, when a bank uh, it has lost the confidence of the, of the markets, it goes to the central bank. That's what it does on an hourly or daily basis, and it gets, it tries to get, emergency liquidity. The fast money, the fast wholesale money, exits first. And they're not there to be bailed in when the decision is taken, actually this bank needed resolution. We saw heavy use of ELA in the crisis. You could discuss whether it was the right thing to do. I would think that given the lack of preparedness, given the gravity of the situation, given the lack of instruments, at that moment, the use of extensive ELA in a number of countries was right. But we've seen in the recent case in, in, in Spain, Popular, uh, after two or three days of ELA, that was it. They were out. Um, so there has been a change here, but, but ELA is always available and always presents a potential loophole. Finally, I think I'm over, overstepping my mark in time. Finally, the question of flip-flopping and the, and the role of politics. There has been a zigzag approach in Europe to the question of bail-in. Uh, at first, uh, it looked as if there was going to be bail-in. We had the Northern Rock issue, but they weren't bailed in. Then we had the, the Iceland case. Uh, there was bail-in, and then there wasn't bail-in, and then I won't go through all, all the... But there was a, a zigzag approach there was also a zigzag approach to the use of, of ELA. Was this a coherent policy, or was it just disorderly, incoherent? Probably a bit of both. But now we do have the BRRD. We do have frameworks in all of the countries, in the United States as well, as Wilson has mentioned. Have we? created a situation where there will no longer be flip-flopping? That's not entirely clear. Uh, these cases have not really been tested. The United Kingdom, they bailed out systematically in 2007-8, in the end, and since then they haven't, it hasn't had to be tested. In the United States, after years in which uninsured depositors were bailed in, after September 2008, they were not bailed in. So even though the law says they will be bailed in, it's not entirely clear that that is what will happen. Politics will intervene. Will the new regimes be adhered to? The new regimes may prove to be too restrictive for politicians to stick with them. Uh, There's a very interesting speech by Tim Geithner a few months ago, Per Jacobsen Lecture, uh, 
who says that the new post-crisis U.S. regime, and Wilson has put it well that it was an angry piece of legislation, he says it's too constraining. Uh, he thinks there should have been actually an extension of the scope of preventative action, including ELA, guarantees, asset purchases to a wider range of intermediaries beyond the, the licensed banks. And then it's gone in the opposite direction. It's introduced a variety of limitations on the freedom of action of the Fed and other agencies. In Europe, we have the BRRD, but I think the Italian case, um, and Wilson referred to it as, as a loophole, it does look close to a kind of evasion or circumvention of the intentions of the authors of, of the BRRD. Part of the problem is surely that the new bail-in regime was introduced before the legacy issues from the crisis uh, had been fixed. But the time for making that excuse is, is nearly past now. I think I've used up my time. I won't repeat what I've said. Let's uh, have the yep. discussion from Thank you both for the very thoughtful and, and rich interventions. So I was hoping that Patrick would, and he did. Uh, so thank you for that. We're running a bit late, as you notice, um, but we'll now start our interactive Q&A. So let me invite all of you to focus on the chat box and write your thoughts, comments, uh, or any direct questions to our speakers. So if there are too many contributions, I will regroup them. Maybe in the meantime, while participants prepare their questions, um, Wilson, was there one point you would like to pick up on? Um, just activate your sound, please, Wilson. Yeah, uh, I think we're on now. Um, Thanks. I agree very much with the points yep. that, that uh, Patrick has made. I uh, would want to talk a little bit about bail-inable bonds. Uh, and I do think the form of this and the credibility of this, both from an economic and political standpoint, is very important. Um, if they are retail in nature, there will be some political incentives. Um, to potentially bail them out. And although I tend to be a small L liberal in terms of saying that retail people should be able to buy uh, bonds, I admit they can buy equity, so why not buying bonds? Uh, it has created some political incentives in some countries to protect them. So you might have to address that issue. I think bailing in big institutions that have diversified portfolios is much easier. Um, but the the point I really wanted to make there is a question of incentives around bail-in and uh, the, uh, an important and I think often overlooked benefit of bail-in bonds versus, say, more equity. Um, bank managers, uh, bank boards of directors understand incentives when they're used in practice. They're probably a lot less good at reading written policies than many of the people on this call, but if they get bonked on the head with a bail-in and lose their job or their equity investment, they will learn if they see one of their friends get bonked in the head and lose his job or get wiped out as an equity holder, that's an incentive. So from a perspective of teaching managers that uh, risk management is important, uh, I think it sends a very important signal that the system will learn from in a way that the private sector really understands. Uh, if you talk to them about burden sharing, they'll say, okay, I'll just make sure I negotiate hard and get, spend as much time in my national capital as possible. But if you lose your investment or lose your job, that's a very simple process, and it's something that, uh, unfortunately, when I've looked at what uh, people learn from in my business, that's often the most effective incentive. OK, thank you. So we have three questions. Uh, let's start maybe with the one by Zoe, and then there are two questions on liquidity. Uh, maybe Patrick first. I'm, I'm not getting the first question, not, not getting an attraction on the first question. Baden avoids the crisis through assets fire sales, but how about channeling the crisis through the primary or secondary capital markets where these products are, are issued and traded? I'm not sure that bail-in avoids uh, channeling the crisis through, oh, it avoids channeling the uh, assets through asset fire sales, yeah. Um, hmm, well, this is, this, is what it, this is what it does. I mean, bail-in uh, means that the ability of the bank to, to uh, keep going on the basis of, of the capital that has been provided is, is gone. So the, those 
Perhaps the questioner could, could yeah. clarify. Maybe, maybe I don't know why, why that. We can ask, yeah, we can ask Zoe to re-specify otherwise. Uh, Please, a point there that the questioner may be going after is kind of, if we're putting the pressure not on a sovereign government, but on a certain class of investors, is that we are privatizing these losses. And so the losses are going to go somewhere. And it seems to me the question is really oriented towards, is that a stable solution? Is that a stable pair of hands to absorb losses? Um, to me, I think trying to put losses on runnable or short-term liabilities is a mugs game. Uh, they'll get out of town faster than you can impose losses, mm -hmm. and it'll be somewhat chaotic. Uh, but if you've got large long-term capital markets, the debt markets are huge, equity markets are huge. Um, if we're looking at diversified institutional investors, um, they can handle losses of this caliber. I think um, uh, if you look even at 2008 scale losses, they can handle losses of that scale quite, quite easily in my view. They'll certainly complain about it. Uh, it's no fun. Um, but the kind of losses we had to put through the system um, in 2008 are actually no larger than the write downs we saw in the tech bust in the early 2000s. Um, that was a market that was well handled to absorb those losses. I think with proper long-term debt and equity design in the world of banks, we can get to the same place. Okay, thanks. May I ask you, Wilson, to answer Baudouin's question on liquidity because Patrick covered that um, lightly already. Uh, and then the question by Francisco, if you don't, if you don't mind, Patrick, this would be for you. I think Baudouin's question is very important in in any in any industry. It's not just the solvency transactions; it's also liquidity support. Uh, that's very important for ensuring a successful resolution. Uh, for example, Toys R Us, a big retailer in the U.S., is going through bankruptcy now. And getting enough liquidity so they can get toys in their stores before Christmas is essential for that company to succeed, even though it's a viable um, uh, net margin positive company today. Banks are much more liquidity sensitive than toy stores. And so you need to have, I think, a very large, incredible liquidity program. Uh, I am concerned, for example, in the U.S. about the hamstringing of the Fed. Um, I'm hopeful that in a crisis there will be solutions to that, uh, but that is a concern. Uh, one side note there that I think is also interesting and overlooked is actually with the Title I strategies the U.S. banks have put in place. They are basically pre-positioning emergency liquidity on their own balance sheet. The new rules have shifted to basically saying you have to carry around your own debtor in, in possession financing your resolution financing on the asset side and trigger resolution when that pile is still big enough. What that means in practice is that U.S. banks would actually go into a resolution mode and recapitalization mode much earlier uh, than we would have thought uh, and that would be necessary if you had a, a more traditional lender of last resort capability. I don't think that's particularly good policy, uh, but I think it is uh, you know, an intelligent legal response to the constraints of the U.S. rules, but it's a it's a big policy move. Right. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, I think that um, the lender last resort function. We've seen a number of of challenging issues here. Lots of people think that laymans should have got lender of last resort. Uh, and that that would have smoothed over the problem and it could have given time uh, to, to clarify just how big the losses were. But if the central bank gives lender of last resort to a bank that it knows is insolvent, it is de facto preferring one creditor over another. So if you're starting to build huge amounts of, of uh, ELA, you're going to have to compensate some people later when the, when the courts uh, come, come into play. Short-term ELA, it can be absolutely vital to to give you the time to clarify what's going on. Um, there was a lot of ELA given in Europe in October of 2008, which went away very quickly as soon as a, a viable recapitalization or restructuring of the entity had been decided. So it mightn't have been three days, it might have been a, a matter of a few weeks. I think ELA can be very useful, and the central bank has got to make a very quick call 
key to this, of course, is that the central bank has enough information. So that's one of the advantages of integrating in Europe the single supervisory mechanism into the central bank so that the flows of, of, of information are better than they were. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. So the next question, before moving to Joseph's question uh, by Sharada, is on fines and penalties. Mm -hmm. Who would like to pick this one up? This is a, a delicate topic well, uh, for, for, for a private banker. <laughs> Wilson has a conflict. Two, uh, <laughs> um, two, eco there, two there, economists there, in there the room. <laughs> there are sizable, there are sizable uh, additional capital requirements now for uh, for uh, G CIFIs, uh, also for national CIFIs. Uh, these are being in, being put in place to, uh, for the smaller country, for the smaller you know for the national CIFIs, but for the G CIFIs, they're already in place. So it's already clawing back some of the advantage that the large banks had because of their implicit too big to fail guarantee. To some extent, if too big to fail has gone away, as Wilson argues that it has, maybe the argument for these fines is somewhat smaller, but uh, probably we're not there yet. Yeah, and I would say that to, to me, you know, they have been effective in certainly changing a lot of behaviors within organizations. Um, Compliance and risk departments are staffed with thousands more people. Maybe you don't think that's enough, but it, it's a massive cost on the system. Uh, the point that I, I might suggest is important here is making sure that people know what the rules are ex ante, uh, as opposed to um, developing fine schedules ex post. Um, there has been a sense on, on my side of the wall that uh, there's a fair amount of retribution uh, for the crisis uh, embedded in these fines, um, and I understand that politically. But if you want to change behavior, making sure people know what you're driving at ex ante, I think, is is the important element here. But it's certainly been substantial, and banks have responded. We Banks have spent close to a quarter trillion dollars in fines, and that uh, very much gets the attention of CEOs, boards of directors, and all kinds of parts of the organization. OK, thanks. Um, Joe's question is on structural reforms. Uh, but I think, I mean, both Patrick and, and Wilson, you should feel free to be able to answer this one. Uh, maybe uh, I'll jump in first and then be interested in Patrick's views. Uh, I'm a skeptic on structural reform. In fact, I think it is counterproductive. Uh, I think. Um, the more you slice and dice a bank, the more you lose diversification benefit, which is one of the things that makes a bank tick. Um, if you look at banks as a means to transform, you know, hopefully high quality credit investments, but still risky credit investments into safe deposits, you need good credit underwriting, you need diversification, you need an equity layer, and ideally a bail-in layer. If you lose diversification because you're slicing the bank up into columns, I think you make banks naturally more dangerous. More, they're certainly more cumbersome to manage. Uh, so I've still I've struggled to see the real benefit of either one of these reforms. I'm inclined to agree. I, I think that there there were great advantages and, and still are great advantages from universal banks uh, for the reasons Wilson mentioned. However, they're very very difficult to manage and to understand. But by dividing them and putting in some kind of safe uh, bank to one side, and we'll only look at that, and we'll let the others out into the Wild West, you don't actually remove the risk. You just l move it a little bit from your, uh, your attention. And when that blows up, it will come back and contaminate the rest of the system. So uh, I, I think that the reforms that have been proposed are not all that damaging, uh, and I think that uh, it's possible to achieve the much of the synergies that that, that were already in place, but I um, I think it's a, a false hope that by having uh, some something like a narrow bank uh, in there, uh, that that that's all you need to worry about. You're going to have to worry about the rest of the system, which is taking risk and which is going to spill over to the economy. Okay, thank you. So we have a few minutes left. We'll we'll go until two fifteen. So if there are more questions, uh, we can accept one or two more. Vincenzo has a prospective question uh, on risk distribution and banking union. 
what should be a common agenda to follow? What do you think? So I think that uh, absolutely we're already a long way down towards a unified European regulatory and, and legal and regulatory structure for banking. Uh, the SSM supervises all of the banks, directly or indirectly, and uh, there's no way that some countries can say, oh, your regulator dropped the ball, you're going to have to look after the, the, the fallout of, of the problem that has, has now arisen. Um, so I, I think this, this should be the trend, uh, banking common in Europe, uh, regulator common, and, and costs common. Hopefully not much in the way of fiscal costs because of the BRRD, but uh, that everybody's pulling together on this. Um, now, having, having said that, what we don't have, and we have less than we had before the crisis in Europe, is an, a completely integrated uh, banking, not banking regulation, but banking, because so many banks have retreated from cross-border business. And if we had larger, large banks actually working cross-border and not just in the investment rank, banking space, we would already be pooling the risk. In a well, one way. important side benefit to that is if you look at uh, the resolutions that took place over the summer, uh, for example, the uh, Santander Popular transaction uh, or the Enteza uh, Venetian Bank, uh, Veneto Bank transactions, both of those were transactions inside a country. Um, in the U.S., one of the main ways you handle mid-size or smaller banks is a so-called purchase and assumption transaction. You take the good bank part, you move that to a, a larger acquirer who finds a strategic advantage in that. In Europe, if you're only dealing with international border, if you can only look for a larger uh, bank uh, for th those types of transactions within a border, you've got a much more narrow set of people to go to. And in the case of the Italian situation, that proved quite expensive for the state. So for this class of resolution types, which I think it's not bail-in, it's a, a different type that's often used for smaller banks, I think opening up Europe to cross-border transactions and having banks be much more comfortable uh, moving across into France or Austria or wherever would be very helpful in handling mid-size and small bank cases. Uh, and I think that would be an important reform. And to date, I think banks are quite nervous about going across borders. Uh, just to add, add to that point, if you think about the overall net long-term losses from the banking, direct losses from, from uh, banking uh, failures in, in this crisis in Europe, it's only a few percentage points of European GDP. But because it was concentrated in a number of countries, uh, including small countries, it, brought, it, it put huge stress on the financial systems and the government system, financial systems of those countries, which spilled over to the rest of Europe and wasn't handled well. So if there had been a more integrated approach, uh, this could have been, could have blown over. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the seminar is actually drawing to a close, so I, as I can see that uh, people are getting back to work bit by bit. So let me thank you all for your active participation. I'd like to warmly thank in particular, obviously, Wilson and Patrick for their time and dedication, and all of you for your questions and comments. So I found that to be extremely nice. Our next online seminar on resolution planning will be held on the 4th October with Mauro Grande and Sophie Steins Bishop, both at the SRB. So don't forget to register for it. Uh, I hope to see you there again. Have a good afternoon and thank you for watching.